open the pod bay doors, though. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could while away. 46, 56 degrees. Thanks for coming to see me. I, I wasn't expecting this many crowd. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about game theory a little bit, and then a little bit about some applications to Cold War, so that you know that might be just preview to movie. And uh, so, game theory is the study of strategic interaction. So whenever there are multiple players who make a decision, and the uh, outcome depends on everybody's decisions, then we will have a game theoretic situation. In such a problem, a player's action often depends on not only on his own payoff, but also what he thinks about what the other people are going to do. But then what the other people are going to do depend on their uh, payoffs. Therefore, he also needs to think about what the other people's payoffs are. But that's not enough, because he has to think about what the other people are going to do, what the other people are going to do depends on their payoff and what they think about the other people. Therefore, they have to think about what the other people think about, <laughs> beliefs about other people's beliefs. And this will never stop. There's an infinite regress problem that goes infinity. And that's, that's what makes game theoretical analysis highly difficult and conceptually difficult, actually. So game theory has many applications today. So in social sciences, game theory is the main tool that's used in economics. So in any theoretical paper, you will have to have uh, some game theoretical model you will have. So, and, and political science, sociology, that can go on. In engineering, in computer science, obviously, game theory is a fun, uh, important concept. But also in Aero-Astro and many other game theoretical uh, engineering problems. So in business, obviously it's very central. In law, law and economics, even in medicine, when you do cancer research, you use game theory. So believe it or not. So in biology, it's also central. So it's a very common tool. So I have like 100 students every year in my undergraduate class. So that shows that, you know, a lot of people are interested. So here's a brief history of game theory. So game theory way goes way back, but uh, written history, for example, important work was done in 1800s in European economists, like Cournot applied game theoretical analysis to oligopoly problem that's called now Cournot oligopoly. Edgeworth used that for other stuff. But the main uh, thing happened during the Cold War in the United States. So the first person that you would like to uh, no, is John von Neumann. You know, he was a brilliant guy who did a lot of work in, you know, physics and mathematics, and he is the founding father of computing. He's also one of the founding fathers of uh, game theory. His work on zero-sum games started many, uh, you know, started modern game theory, and then he also did some, co you know, cooperative game theory. But these guys were working on Cold War. They had they. So they had ideas that applied to war, but not in real life. So non-zero-sum games didn't work for very well. And John Nash, in, in his dissertation, then he developed an idea, equilibrium concept, that applied to non-zero-sum games. So it seemed obvious mathematically, but actually it was a major step because actually he went outside of Cold War thinking. And then John Harsanyi introduced incomplete information and so on and so forth. And in the 80s, after, I think after John Harsanyi's work in 1967, game theory became commonly used. In the 80s, it became really the main tool in economics. So what about game theories in the US during the Cold War? So basically, in, in that era, every game th theorist, major game theorist worked for government usually Department of Defense, Depart State Department, Rand Corporations, and so on. But the main person, for example, John von Neumann, as a mathematician, he was in Manhattan Project. He was the head of Atomic Energy Commission. And then he oversaw hydrogen bomb. And then he, as a game theorist, he was credited for 
mad, mutually assured destruction. And this movie is a critic of that idea. Okay? And then when you see uh, Dr. Strangelove, you are going to realize that actually he's a very, very smart guy. And in fact, partly based on John von Neumann. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to here talk about a little, some couple uh, notions of ga in game theory and give a couple examples. So like one thing is obviously when there are many people, there are co there's conflict, there's room for cooperation. If there's no room for cooperation, then it's the trivial game. And then coordination, communication, these are the main concepts. And then you are going to see in the movie coming again and again, these kind of concepts. And commitment, that will be very important. So here is the idea of mutually assured destruction, for like, you know, like baby version of it, considered two nuclear powers. Let's call them USA and USSR. And each committed to attack the other power with full force if attacked. For each country, attacking the other country triggers an attack on its own soil. Therefore, in equilibrium, they won't attack. That's the idea of mutual assured destruction. That's the whole idea, OK? But then, when you think about it, there are many problems there. What if one attacks by mistake? <laughs> so at that point, right, you don't want them to attack by, with the full force. You want to kill as many as uh, you want to attack more. So that's a, the second idea is, what about, how do you know that a country can commit to attack? For example, suppose that there was a mistake and it, one attack came to California or Hawaii. Why would U.S. attack and start a war? Maybe they would call back saying that I, we understand it was a mistake. We are not going to attack, but this is the last time. But the, if, <laughs> if people ex expect that, then, you know, then they will attack next day, you know, another, maybe Arizona, I don't know. <laughs> so, so then how can you commit? That's another question. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply, the, give these examples with some simple things. So let's call something called doomsday mission. Suppose that USSR has a doomsday mission that will destroy the entire world. So suppose that any attack in USSR automatically triggers the doomsday mission. So then what would happen? And this is common knowledge, meaning that, you know, US knows that and, and so on. How can you solve this game as a game theorist? You do backward induction. So first of all, if USSR attacks the USSR, then doomsday mission is triggered and the US is destroyed. So US doesn't want that. So knowing this, US doesn't attack. That's very simple. But we made a lot of assumptions here. Uh, so let's change it without commitment. Suppose that USSR has doomsday mission that will destroy the entire world, but after any attack, USSR decide whether to trigger the doomsday mission. And this is common knowledge. So what will happen? Well, suppose there is an attack. And then USSR will think, well, if I, start the, if I destroy the entire world, I'm going to die too. So they wouldn't use the machine. Knowing this, US attacks USSR. <laughs> <laughs> so let's make this one. This shows the power of commitment, OK? And then the next one, let's think about the common knowledge, the information aspect of it, the communication aspect of this model, this problem. Suppose that USSR has a doomsday mission that will destroy the entire world. Any attack on USSR automatically triggers the doomsday mission. This time it's automatic, it's, there's commitment. But US is not aware of the doomsday mission. Assumes that USSR is not committed to attacking back. So how would you solve this problem? Well, first of all, if there's attack, then doomsday mission is triggered and the US is destroyed. But US doesn't know that. They think that it's going to be, uh, they are not committed. If we attack, they are not going to attack. We have seen that, right? And therefore, they figure out and then they attack. And they trigger the destruction of the Earth. OK, so this was because the lack of common knowledge. All right. So the thing is, if you actually construct a doomsday mission, make sure that everybody knows it. <laughs> That's the main lesson. Okay. Uh, that's the end of it. Thank you. <laughs>